Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Happy Thursday. Thanks for joining our SageMaker webinar. Today, we're going to cover the XGBoost algorithm, which I can tell is a very um, uh, interesting topic for a lot of people. We had a, a great many of registrations, and we've got a lot of you on the lines today, so thanks for joining us. Um, I am Sue Ewig, and I'm the AWS Global Partner Marketing Manager for AI and Machine Learning. Um, everybody on this webinar today, all of you, belong to one of our consulting partners who've achieved the AWS machine learning competency. So um, these are private webinars just for you to learn more about the algorithms that are associated with SageMaker and to ask any questions that you have. Um, our main presenter today is Chris Scrinak. That's Chris with a K. He is our par a partner solution architect for AWS and he leads the machine learning segment globally. Joining Chris also on the line is Pratap Ramamurthy, who is going to be taking your questions. So he's kind of monitoring the question and answer panel that's on the right navigation pane of the GoToWebinar interface. Um, during the webinar, just pop your questions in there so we can make sure that we address all of them during the call. Sometimes we don't get to all of them, even though we have an hour and 45 minutes. Um, and in that case, we will send an email afterward um, with some with answers to those additional questions. Um, Speaking of, after the webinar, we will you will get the recording for today's webinar, which includes the presentation, um, so any of the materials that Chris shows you today. Um, and uh, let's just jump right in. I know Chris is pumped up. This is a really popular algorithm, and he's uh, excited to share it with you. So Chris, take it away. Hello, world. This is Chris Screenack. So we're going to talk about the ultimate weapon in machine learning. It is XGBoost. So why is that the ultimate weapon and the choice of so many data scientists? Um, XGBoost, which stands for Extreme Gradient Boosting, is a popular and efficient open source implementation of the Gradient Boosted Trees algorithm. Gradient Boosting is a machine learning algorithm that attempts to accurately predict target variables by combining the estimates of a set of simpler, weaker models. By applying a gradient boosting to decision tree models in a highly scalable manner, XGBoost does remarkably well in machine learning competitions and in business. It's also, it also robustly handles a variety of data types, relationships, and distributions. It provides a large number of hyperparameter variables that can be used to tune and improve model performance. This flexibility makes XGBoost a solid choice for various machine learning problems, in particular, working on tabular data. You may know XGBoost because it is pretty much the king of Kaggle. That is where uh, its name was really made. You could see on the chart there uh, that between, well, 2013 uh, just was, had, was a remarkable year for XGBoost. In particular, uh, it won this Higgs Boson Machine Learning Challenge. I'll just uh, bring up that page very quickly. Um, and of course, you'll be uh, the PowerPoint will be available to everyone on the call after the call. Uh, but this is this is the one that sort of put uh, XGBoost uh, on the scene, and it's what you know most people refer to as its sort of uh, starting point. But it's notable that it won a number of other competitions on Kaggle, including the Predicting House Prices Playground. Outbrain Click Prediction, the Allstate Claims Severity Competition, Santander Product Recommendation, Talking Data Mobile User Demographics, uh, the Red Hat Business Value Prediction. And you can see that this is quite a broad spectrum of vertical markets that um, XGBoost found uh, some love in. Uh, but I will point out that if you take a look at that chart, which ends in 2016, that deep neural nets began to overtake it there. Um, so once again, uh, I'll just qualify that uh, XG Boost is, is really, really useful for predicting a number, predicting a class based off of tabular data, but for image recognition and media recognition, um, deep learnings uh, still certainly um, is, is the machine learning uh, algorithm of choice. So a little bit of terminology. Uh, first of all, uh, XGBoost is a supervised learning technique. That means that your data is labeled. 
Uh, importantly, you've made some observations about a thing, an event, or collected characteristics, or have used those characteristics to make additional features. And for each set of those features, you have given a label. Once you've identified a label for an observation, you can use many techniques to create a model uh, to uh, create predictions, importantly, backpropagation. Backpropagation and its recent variant developed by Jeffrey Hinton at the University of Toronto using GPUs is principally responsible for the current renaissance of AI and machine learning. Regression is a set of techniques for predicting a number. Classification is a set of techniques for predicting a class or identifying a discrete object such as a cat or dog. A decision tree is a technique that uses a tree-like graph of decisions and their possible consequences, including chance event outcomes, <clears throat> excuse me, resource costs, and utility. It's one way to display an algorithm that only contains, contains conditional control statements. Uh, finally, ensemble learning. The use of multiple machine learning techniques in a model to obtain a better predictive performance uh, than could be obtained with just the constituent learning algorithms alone is generally referred to as ensemble learning. Next, uh, bias and variance error. So uh, these are important concepts because uh, in the process of refining a model, uh, if you take a look at these uh, targets here, right, I think they pretty well illustrate. If you just look horizontally um, around low bias, uh, you'll see that uh, you have a very tight cluster on the upper left-hand corner target. Um, and then a cluster that's somewhat spread out, that's a high variance, low bias uh, illustration. But you can see it's generally centered around the target. If you look at the lower two targets, um, a high bias with low variance is clustered, but it's not hitting the target. And then high bias and high variance in the lower right is just, you know, awful. <laughs> so um, we're, we're really talking about error. And when we're refining a model, typically what we're looking at is uh, being able to get as, as good an error figure or as low an error uh, ratio as possible. So bias error is useful to quantify how much on average are uh, predicted values different from an actual value? A high bias error means that we have an underperforming model and we keep missing important trends. So variance on the other side quantifies how are the predictions made on some observation different from each other. A high variance model will overfit on your training population and perform badly on an observation beyond training. Follow, uh, and then boosting uh, and, uh, excuse me, so boosting is a, a general technique for correcting bias errors and in particular adaptive boosting and gradient boosting. Um, generally, boosting algorithms um, allow uh, fitting many weak classifiers to reweighted versions of the training data. Um, so a weak classifier, now that I've used that term, is an algorithm that's slightly better than random guessing. So, so what does this look like graphically? Uh, so if you take a look at box one, two, and three, you can see that using uh, some weak uh, predictions on those boxes, we are poorly classifying the positives from the negatives. In box four, we've combined those techniques to create a much better classifier. Now, what is gradient boosting? Uh, with gradient boosting, we are taking, um, we're using, well, stochastic gradient descent uh, to create a much more refined model uh, to get to our target values. Now, decision trees, uh, generally, and this is from uh, the, the, the initial XGBoost paper, uh, decision trees are essentially binary trees. Uh, this particular tree illustrates uh, how we would um, uh, predict the likelihood that a, an individual was a gamer. So here we see if you're on the tree on the left, if you're less than 15 and you're male, you have a very high probability. If you're female, it's still high, but a little bit lower. If you're older than 15, the probability goes negative. So it's pretty clear. Um, 
in reality, uh, these trees get a lot more complex. Uh, and one of the important aspects of any tree is determining how many, how, how deep you want the tree to go. So in this illustration uh, right here, we see the strong green line has a, a depth of one. And it is, so, you know, it's, it's clearly underfitting the data as we add more, uh, as we add more nodes to the tree depth, it gets more accurate, but we do run the danger on the very smallest uh, depth line of 20 of extreme overfitting. So that's all about trees. Let's talk about ensemble learning. So I heard this uh, conversationally the other day, and I, and I thought it was a pretty good example of, of what uh, of how to understand ensembles. So let's say that you were considering buying a stock, and you got recommendations from six completely independent sources. Uh, one was the employee of the company and the company that you wanted to invest. And let's say he was right 70% of the time. The second was a financial advisor of the company, and he's right 75% of the time. The third was a stock market trader. He's right 70%. Um, you met an employee of a competitor. Let's say he was right 60% of the time. A market research firm in the same segment was right 75% of the time. And then finally, you meet a social media expert and he's right 65% of the time on his stock recommendations. Now, I mentioned how often they were right, but let's consider how frequently they're wrong, right? So uh, obviously the employee of the company is right 30, he's right 70% of the time, that means his error is 30%. And if we add up all their error rates, and these are all completely independent opinions, then we, and, and they all conclude that you should buy this stock, then you have a pretty high degree of confidence that this is a, a good decision. So 99.92, that's, that's pretty high. What if these people all know each other? Well, you really have to throw that out the window. <laughs> these have to be complete and independent uh, opinions or else you, you really can't create a good predictive model. So a little bit of history on XGBoost before we uh, dig into the code. Um, it was started by a, a graduate student, uh, Tian Qi Chen. <clears throat> I looked at his um, webpage yesterday and he's still at the University of Washington. Um, of course, as I mentioned, they're famous for winning the Higgs Machine Learning Challenge in 2014. There are implementations, and this is separately managed uh, by uh, his group, uh, on, in C++, Python, R, Java, Scala, Julia, and even Node. So now let's focus on XGBoost itself. So gradient-boosted trees work by combining predictions from many simple models, each of which tries to address the weakness of the previous model, as I've, as I've illustrated. So XGBoost is an implementation of those boosted trees. And what happens is as we go through cycles that repeatedly build new models and combine them into an ensemble model, we start the cycle by taking an, exi an existing model and calculating errors for each observation in the data set. We then build a new model to predict these errors. Then we add predictions from this error predicting model to the ensemble of models. To make a prediction, we add the predictions from all the previous models, and we can use these predictions to calculate new errors, build the next model, and add it to the ensemble. That's the cycle, but there's one piece that's uh, missing. We need a base prediction to get started. Um, in practice, initial predictions can be pretty naive, uh, even if its predictions are wildly inaccurate, subsequent additions to the ensemble will address those errors. So what are the advantages of XGBoost? Uh, probably the top one is number one, um, heterogeneous data. Uh, think about a spreadsheet, a SQL statement. Um, you know, you really don't need to go through all the effort of uh, feature scaling. Um, you don't have to do a lot of feature engineering. I mean, you should, <laughs> but uh, you don't have to. Um, it handles missing values and outliers. It can deal with irrelevant inputs. Uh, I've seen a lot of tests where people just add noise. 
uh, to XGBoost models and the final models uh, are, are almost not affected. Um, it can handle mixed predictors, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. It also has support for a lot of different loss functions. It can automatically detect feature interactions. It's very fast at prediction. The results are interpretable. This is really valuable. So interpretable that you can create independent rule sets. It also distributes training uh, in training very easily, which can reduce uh, dramatically training time. Uh, a few more advantages. Um, so uh, you to find the best split, uh, so finding split algorithms, to find the best split over a continuous feature, uh, data needs to be sorted and fit entirely into uh, memory, which can be a problem in the case of large uh, data sets. So an approximate algorithm is used for this. Uh, candidate split points are proposed based on the percentiles of feature distribution. The continuous features are binned into buckets that are split based on candidate split points. The best solution for candidate split points are chosen from the aggregate statistics for the buckets. Uh, column block for parallel, parallel, excuse me, parallel learning. Um, so in this situation, we're sorting the data uh, and sorting the data is the most common time consuming aspect of tree learning. To reduce sorting costs, data is stored in memory units called blocks. Each block has data columns sorted by the corresponding feature value. This computation needs to be done only once before training and can be reused later. Sorting of blocks can be done independently and then can be divided between parallel threads of the CPU. The split finding can be parallelized as a collection of statistics for each column when each for each column is done in parallel. Uh, weighted quantile sketch for approximate tree learning. To propose candidate split points amongst weighted data sets, the weighted quintile sketch algorithm is used. It carries out merge and prune operations on quantile summaries over the data. Uh, also sparsity aware algorithms are used. Input may be sparse due to reasons such as one hot encoding, missing values, and zero entries. XGBoost is, is aware of the sparsity pattern in the data and visits only the default direction in each node. Um, cache aware access uh, is an algorithm designed to minimize the movement of mem memory pages in and out of the processor's on-chip memory cache. Out of core computation, for data that does not fit into main memory, you can divide the data into multiple blocks and store each block on disk. You can compress the block by columns and decompress on the fly in an independent thread while disk reading. Finally, uh, to measure the performance of a model, you are given a set of parameters and we need to define an objective function. An objective function must always contain two parts, a training loss and regularization. So the regularization term penalizes the complexity of the model. Uh, so where omega here is the regularization term where algorithms forget to include an objective function. However, XGBoost includes regularization, thus controlling the complexity of the model and preventing overfitting. So, the above six features may be individually present in some algorithms, but XGBoost combines all of these techniques to make an end-to-end -end system that provides scalability and effective resource utilization. Okay, there's a few disadvantages. Uh, training uh, can be onerous. Um, it can be slow. And importantly, it extrapolates very poorly. Let me give you an example here. It's possible if you are given out of bounds uh, uh, data on inference that you can get illogical values. Um, so if you take a look at, at the chart on the upper left here, um, gradient boosting has to minimize the loss function you use. You, you might, uh, and you might have bounds for your labels, but gradient boosting does not look at those bounds and does not bound the predictions. So you can see clearly in this upper left uh, that with one variable, although you have one variable X and only positive um, uh, observations, 
the if you, if you were to predict five, you actually get a negative value. I don't know if you could see my pointer there or not. So the the same as the next story on the chart below, uh, but you're given uh, you know a positive value that is it, that isn't uh, correct. So generally, if you take a look at other machine learning algorithms. Um, we may or may not have that problem, but it's particularly important with uh, XGBoost to recognize that out-of-bound inference can give you, uh, you know, poor results, uh, unusable results. Um, so I mentioned there's a lot of hyperparameters. <laughs> um, this is another really big problem. Um, now, I want to point out a handful. There's more than 40 parameters that you can uh, modify on uh, SageMaker's uh, version of XGBoost. Um, but three are very important, so let me just uh, walk through those just a little bit. Um, so first of all, max depth. Uh, the max depth of a tree, if set too small, can underfit the data. You might recall my um, uh, chart just a, a few slides back with the, the bold green line. While increasing it will make it more complex and thus more likely to overfit. Now the min child weight hyperparameter uh, is the minimum sum of instance weight or the Haitian derivative of the gradient needed in a child. If the tree partition step results in a leaf node with the sum of instance weight less than min child weight, the building process gives up further partitioning. In linear regression models, this simply corresponds to the number of instances needed in each node. Gamma uh, is a regularization control and it prevents overfitting. The higher the gamma is, the higher the regularization. The default value is zero, which is uh, no regularization. Um, I'll mention one more, which is sort of uh, highlighted in the, the second section there, uh, which is ETA. So that is the step size shrinkage used in updates to prevent overfitting. After each boosting step, you can directly get the weights of new features. The ETA hyperparameter actually shrinks the feature weights to make the boosting process more conservative. Um, but don't worry, uh, we have uh, a lot going on with the AWS uh, implementation of XGBoost that uh, takes a lot of that uh, off of your shoulders. So first of all, um, XGBoost on uh, SageMaker is really designed for high scale, high volume uh, classification or regression. So with distributed training, XGBoost on SageMaker allows customers to train massive data sets on multiple machines. Just specify the number and the size of machines that you want and we will scale out. Amazon will automatically take care of distributing the data and the training process. Now, sharded by Amazon S3 uh, key training, what that, that refers to is um, that requires that you partition your data on S3 in advance of training. This allows SageMaker to download each partition of the data set to individual nodes rather than downloading all the data on all the nodes. This saves time in downloading the data set from S3 and ultimately speeds up training jobs. Um, instance weighted training using XGBoost on SageMaker allows you to add weights to individual data points also referred to as instances while you're training. This allows customers to differentiate the importance of different instances during model training by assigning them weight values. I just had a conversation about that last night. Um, so Spark integration is key. Uh, with the Spark SDK, we provide a concise API for developers to interact with XGBoost from Spark. Uh, developers can first pre-process data on Apache Spark, then call XGBoost and SageMaker directly from their Spark environment. I'm going to have a quick demo of that in just a few moments. This spins up the Amazon SageMaker training instance and uses them to train on the data that was already pre-processed with Spark. So easy deployment and managed model hosting. After a model is trained, you only need one API call to deploy in production at scale. SageMaker hosting is managed and can be configured for auto-scaling, which reduces the overhead in running a hosting environment. 
And A-B testing. Uh, once you're in production using SageMaker, you can run multiple XGBoost models with different weights of inference. In other words, the incoming traffic can be um, uh, pointed to different XGBoost models. So as a new model, a new trained model uh, can go into production, you can, behind the scenes, put that model into place or even just test it on a small fraction of traffic without touching the endpoint that your applications are all um, accessing. All right, so that's the, the theory and the introduction part. Let's move on to uh, taking a look now at uh, some of the sample notebooks. Um, so I've started up a, a SageMaker instance here, and I just need to clear some of this uh, webinar stuff off of my screen so I can see what I'm doing. Almost there. All right, there we go. Um, all right, so uh, I've started an ex uh, a, a, a notebook instance on SageMaker, and here I am in Jupyter. And I have uh, a number of notebooks that I'd, I'd like to go through. We probably won't get through all of these, um, but because of the versatility of XGBoost, uh, we have more models uh, in our sample, in our SageMaker, ex SageMaker example uh, set than um, almost any other algorithm. Um, I'm going to start with the simple and get, and, and certainly before the top of the hour. Um, or I guess the, the bottom of the hour, which would be our, our one hour mark here, um, get to hyperparameter optimization, which is uh, one of the key benefits of, of running XGBoost on, on SageMaker. So um, I'll start with this simple example. It is um, the Abalone uh, data set. So what we're doing here uh, in this particular notebook, oh, and if, and if it wasn't 100% uh, clear, um, every one of the notebooks that I'm going to open up right now um, is available in the SageMaker example uh, set, which comes with every SageMaker implementation. So you can use this as a reference. You can use it as a, a cut and paste um, way to start your own models. Um, often in these seminars, we will create new content, but there's so much excellent content that's just in the SageMaker um, that's give, that we give away for free, and and the issues are so complex. I just thought it would be annoying or distracting to create something original for this demo. Um, so what we want to do with the Abalone uh, data set is instead of cracking open the shells and and counting the rings, you know, we we want to be able to use um, characteristics of the physical measurements of the abalone to guess its age, right? That's that's the 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 problem that's being addressed here. So in typical SageMaker style, um, the very first cell uh, we're importing uh, whatever Python modules we need along with SageMaker's execution role. Um, we're allocating an S3 bucket to both download uh, our data set and to uh, put our uh, trained model in when it's done. Okay, so job number one, we're gonna download the data set and then we're gonna split it into a training, a validation, and a test set. Um, whenever you're using SageMaker, you always wanna have at least a training and validation set. Uh, when you provide a validation set to uh, SageMaker built-in models, you automatically get um, hyperparameter optimization. Um, and like I said, we're going to go into the parameters that we expose for you uh, at the end of this presentation. So we upload the data to S3. We divide it. Uh, as far as ingesting the data, let's see, I guess uh, we did a few methods first. So we actually do download it here, and then we uh, uh, make the calls to divide uh, the data set. Um, okay, so next up, one thing that's important for everyone to know using SageMaker is in training, your data is always going to be in S3. So even though we have many storage options available in AWS, when you're using SageMaker, always plan to have your data set in S3. In fact, if you're using Spark and our Spark EMR, uh, our PySpark uh, implementation, what we're doing for you behind the scenes without ever leaving Spark we're saving the data from your data frame into S3, calling the uh, 
the built-in models from SageMaker, returning the results to S3, and then delivering that back to Spark for you. So in fact, you're always training out of S3, even though some of our utilities um, provide convenience functions for you. So you just don't quite see that. So S3 is critical. The other thing that's critical are Docker containers. Um, all of the built-in algorithms are in Docker containers. And in this line right here, what we're doing is we're, we're grabbing the container that has the XGBoost uh, built-in algorithm. The next step here is specifying our training parameters. Um, the first section is just saying, okay, uh, which one are we gonna run? Um, uh, where is the S3 output path? Uh, what type of machine are we going to run this on? And then here we see our training parameters for this particular job. And as mentioned, uh, we have uh, max depth, ETA, and gamma, probably the most uh, important uh, along with uh, min child weight for XG boost. Uh, we have a few others, including subsample silent. Our, obje our objective here is a linear regressor. Um, and num round uh, is set to 50. So uh, we also have a stopping condition. If our training job runs away, we don't want it just billing us you know, forever. So uh, that's another feature within SageMaker. Um, and then finally, we have the details for our S3 buckets for our input data. And yeah, and that's it. Now the SageMaker call that actually trains the job uh, isn't fit, it's described training job. So what you're doing when you call describe training job, I'm sorry, uh, create training job, went to the wrong uh, line there, um, create training job, what that's actually doing is it's taking uh, the hyperparameters that you just set, marrying it with the container that you just uh, accessed, and sending that off to a separate job queue. So in our Jupyter Notebook uh, instance that we're looking at right now, this can run on a very inexpensive machine, not one of the big P3s with all the GPUs in them. Um, now, when you send your job off to train, you could send that to any machine. Now, up in our parameters here, we chose, I believe it was an M4. Yeah, we did. So um, this really is a cost optimization feature. Um, and also, it, what, it's what gives us the ability to automatically scale, not just the memory um, within a single machine, but also to cluster out and uh, share memory through uh, some uh, Bayesian techniques that we have uh, to grow your training job to almost any number of uh, systems in a cluster. So in this particular instance, our wall time was three minutes. Um, our CPU time was pretty small. Um, so I'm often asked what the delta is between those two numbers. Um, that's just loading up the container and uh, getting your processing ready, sitting in the job queue, lo loading the container. This thing ran really, really quickly, uh, but the wall time happened to be three minutes. So the lesson there is um, to recognize that when you're using the job training queue um, and you're actually training with uh, SageMaker, this is really for you know your, your bigger training jobs when you're sending the big data. Um, very often I'll use scikit-learn's version of uh, XGBoost when I'm working on small sample sets and I'm just developing uh, models in the, in the very, very beginning. All right, so now we, the model's been trained. Uh, as, as you can see, I've already run this notebook fully, so for the sake of time. Um, now we're ready to host the model. So uh, when we create our model, we're essentially just getting the, um, getting the training job, getting the model out of the training job that we created. Uh, we're gonna create this model right here, and then we're gonna marry it to what's called a production variant, right? So the variant name here is gonna be all traffic. And what that means, uh, you can see here when it says initial variant weight, we're gonna give it um, uh, all of the traffic. So the weight is a float, it goes from zero to one. Um, and it's essentially the percentage of, tra of traffic that's coming to that particular endpoint. Uh, to create the endpoint, it's really simple. It's just one command, create endpoint. Uh, and then that endpoint will go into production. And then we can begin to do our predictions off of it. In this particular uh, example, uh, we iterated through our, our labels and or through our, our uh, test uh, set. And first on a single prediction, then we ran through the whole set. And I believe we have a confusion matrix at the end here. Uh, no, but we do have uh, a, a, a percentage error. 
So that's the first simple example uh, with the abalone uh, data set. Uh, let's move on to something a little bit more interesting, which is ensemble learning uh, using census data. So the purpose of this particular notebook is to use information from the Census Bureau to determine whether a person makes more than $50,000 a year. So, you know, we're not gonna look at their income, but as we uh, see down here below, and I'm gonna skip some of the stuff that I spent a little bit more time on on the first um, uh, notebook. Uh, let's get right to the data exploration. So we're using Pandas uh, to open up this data set. Pandas is typically alias to PD. And if you look at the actual data here, we have age, uh, the uh, working classification, uh, education, um, how, how far you got in your education, um, uh, marital status, et cetera, right? And a lot of these values are text, right? So we see immediately in our um, data here that we've got to at least do perhaps one hot encoding. Um, if you're not familiar with this concept, uh, basically everything you have to send to XGBoost has to be a number. So typically one hot encoding is used to um, to do that. You take those labels, those categories, give them a one or a zero, say that your class is in there. That's what we've done on this next set using Pandas. Pandas makes it really, really easy to do that. Uh, let's just move down a little bit here and see what the uh, information is for XGBoost itself. Um, so in, term, in terms of, once again, looking at the training parameters, uh, we have the name, the container, S3 locations, and then our algorithm hyperparameters. Um, our data is coming in S in, in CSV format. Now here's something um, that is important to know. Uh, lib SVM, support vector machine format, is the typical input for uh, XGBoost, but we also accept CSV format. Uh, so in this instance, we're gonna use CSV format. Uh, we're taking our training data. Once again, we're gonna set up our hyperparameters. Um, here's the top hyperparameters, as mentioned before, uh, our input and output. We create the training job. We run the training job. Again, it ran uh, in 76 milliseconds once it got there. We set up our training uh, uh, for our hosting container. Then we create the endpoint, which is in production now. And then uh, we do our prediction based on our uh, test set. Um, so. Uh, at the end of this, we're we're gonna uh, we're gonna determine how much um, uh, how accurate our training set was using um, an A AUC uh, predictor. So uh, that is gonna determine. Well, it's sort of a Gaussian approach to taking a look at a confusion matrix. So let's just put it that way. Um, so we set up the uh, approach at the end. Uh, we convert our training data to protobuf format. And then we finally uh, specify some images here and then come down to the end. I wanna to get to the uh, bottom of this one because I think, uh, there we go. Then we finally save our uh, prediction results. All right, so this particular notebook covers a, a lot of issues that are a little bit more complex um, and a little bit more relevant to what I call tabular data or the kind of data that we deal with in you know, most enterprises every day. In other words, when you're working with deep learning, frequently the topics are all around uh, identifying cats and dogs. Um, however, you don't need to do that uh, with XGBoost. You can do image processing with XGBoost. In fact, I uh, I have one example right here. Um, if I come back here, one second. Uh, come back here. here. Is that it? That's not it. I think it's this one. Uh, one moment. Uh, here we go. I just want to make sure this is it. And uh, no, that's not it. Sorry. Um, so I did run it on uh, MNIST. Oh, here it is. And uh, now I'm going to skip all of the setup and just go to the predictive capacity of XG boot. Oh wait, oh that one wasn't run either. Oh, I apologize. Um, okay, so I don't have a pre-run uh, version, but uh, you can use um, XG boost on images and we do have that um, uh, notebook available. Okay, moving into customer churn. 
So uh, this particular notebook seeks to determine which customers are most likely to leave your business. Um, it's using a cell phone uh, data set from UCI, um, and uh, it's also uh, well documented in this book by Daniel LaRose called Discovering Knowledge in Data. Um, and it's not from UCI, actually, it's from uh, dataminingconsultant.com. Uh, but as we take a look at the data here, um, we can see that uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff here, right? It has the location, uh, area code, the actual phone number, whether there's an international plan or not, uh, the amount of billable time on this uh, particular cell phone. So it's, it's, it's a pretty meaningful data set. But not all this data is relevant, right? And so it's pretty well described right here. So what we do in the next couple of uh, cells here is begin to explore this data. So first we're looking for geographical distribution and we can see that it's um, relatively well distributed. Um, if we move into some other uh, features, uh, I, I probably should have mentioned that one of the features, because this is a labeled data set, right? This is supervised learning, is whether there was actual churn on this account. So as we dig into that data, uh, we see, get the following observations, right? It's fairly evenly uh, distributed geographically. Uh, people who leave are more likely to have an international plan, less likely to have voicemail, et cetera. So on that data, we're gonna start eliminating some of the columns, right? Um, we do a scatter plot here of these particular features, which in my humble opinion kind of looks good on the notebook, but it's a little bit hard to read with this, with this much data. So here we are dropping some of the um, not meaningful uh, columns in the data set. We're splitting our data into training, validation, and test. Uh, now we go to train again off of the XG Boost container. We do so by creating this um, estimator. Uh, we set the hyperparameters here and then we set the job off for training. Now, one thing to note about training in SageMaker is of course you get the visual representations here um, right in your notebook, but if we go to the SageMaker console, all this information is available on the left-hand side. So when I go to training jobs and I take a look uh, at the jobs that have run here, um, I can click on any of these, um, and I'll just choose this one right here. And you can see that there's a lot of information on it, including access uh, at the bottom to um, both the CloudWatch and the instance specific uh, logs. So I click on this. So all this stuff is retained, right? So as you train this job, these are all the messages that were generated in the training of the job. So to um, pop back into our churn model, uh, when we deploy this particular model, uh, we're not choosing as many options in the other models. Now, I've often, often called model hosting or model deployment sort of the forgotten child of, of machine learning. There's so much attention on how do we create a model, how do we explore the data, how do we create the data set, uh, that sometimes we forget how do you deploy this thing at scale globally. Well, with SageMaker, it is literally as simple as this one command. Just this one command can do it. And from the SageMaker console, you can do this all just with a GUI, right? You can create an endpoint configuration that says, um, you know, what kind of host do I want this machine on? What's the model? And then I can create uh, an endpoint here just by clicking this create endpoint and finding that um, endpoint configuration. So that is how you deploy a model, not just from Python within a SageMaker notebook, but also graphically, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you can do it with Bash using the AWS CLI. All right, so finally, we're gonna call predict. That's the whole point of launching this um, uh, model in the first place. And in this particular notebook, our confusion matrix um, correctly predicts 39 out of uh, 48 actual churners. Um, so what they get into next here um, is you know this is doing a cutoff at 0.05, right? We're just we're just you know doing a binary cutoff uh, at 0.05, and that might not be the right measure. So the next few cells here are looking for a better value to cross tabulate to get a better predictive value. So you know you run that algorithm. The algorithm doesn't necessarily do it all. In fact, most machine learning algorithms are set up in a, a pipeline.
Um, so the rest of this uh, uh, notebook actually walks through the process of determining what is the correct cutoff point to get true negatives, true positives, um, and differentiate from especially um, the uh, false negatives, which would be the most costly. All right, last but not least, uh, certainly not least, uh, let's take a look at, uh, let's get back to my Jupiter head here. I might just make it easy by uh, uh, reopening this. Uh, let's take a look at a really phenomenal notebook that not only creates um, a, a, a really nice market segmentation model using um, XGBoost, but you can also analyze the results uh, using uh, of, of hyperparameter optimization. I'm going to try to do that in five minutes. So this particular notebook, and we have three variants of this. So um, I don't know if you, you want to know specifically, just send me an email um, or just, you know, explore around uh, the sample notebooks. Uh, but what this what we're doing here is we're uh, creating characteristics of our customers from a transaction log. It happens to be a banking uh, database so that we more accurately target customers with direct marketing. Isn't that a joy? Um, so uh, here we are once again. I'm just going to um, very, go very quickly over the things I've already covered, including downloading the data set. But um, pause a little bit to take a look at the actual data, right? So this is the bank. This is the information the bank has. Um, actually, there's a few data sets when you you get when you download this. There's the transactions themselves, but then this bank additional full .csv has all this qualitative information around. Um, the individuals who are in the data set, right? So job, housemaid, marital status, education, et cetera. So there's a lot of good data here. And, and once again, you know, most of, a lot of that's categorical and it's gonna get hot, one hot encoded, um, but a lot of this data varies widely, right? So as we're going through and we're looking some of these, well, some of these are just, like I said, categorical. But um, some of the observations might be, you know, how much did this particular customer spend? Uh, and that could be in the thousands of dollars to, you know, pennies. And then they might talk about, you know, whether they have a college education or not. So here graphically, what we're illustrating is, you know, what are the actual contents and averages then that are found in the uh, data set itself? Very easy to illustrate. So um, what I love about this notebook, too, is some of the language around data exploration, right? Um, almost 90% of the values of the target values are yes. Um, uh, so, you know, most customers did not subscribe for a term deposit. That's the objective, right, for uh, this particular marketing program. Um, many of the features are unknown. So, you know, uh, without getting into too many of the details here, because I, I encourage you to read this on your own, we need to determine which of these features are useful and predictive and which aren't, um, which can be correlated or uh, combined into other more useful features. Uh, once again, I'm just going to uh, illustrate that a lot of this data is, is here. Um, and then finally, uh, we take a look at the data through that scatter plot. Now, this one actually does bear a little bit of attention, uh, which you can do on your own. Finally, now, uh, we're going to do a little data cleaning. In fact, uh, if you happen to be in New York City tonight uh, at... Um, the 34th Street. Uh, we're going to have our deep learning meetup and Trifacta is presenting. They are uh, one of our uh, competency partners that specializes in cleaning data and feature engineering. Uh, so they clean up the data here. Uh, now we're dividing our training validation set, etc. Most of this now around training is the usual. Uh, and we're setting our hyperparameters, et cetera. Now, this is sort of the plain vanilla version of using XGBoost to uh, uh, clarify who we want to communicate with. The second version, remember I said there's multiple versions of this, um, will actually, and when, and when you get to the training part, you're actually going to specify hyperparameters that you would like varied. So we expose our hyperparameter optimization. Um, uh, 
uh, API for you. And let me show you exactly what that looks like, all right? So we've, we're essentially in the same notebook, but this time before training, we're setting up hyperparameter optimization. And what we're saying here is for ETA, we wanna explore the whole range of values between zero and one. For min child weight, we wanna do uh, between one and 10, uh, alpha zero and two, max depth one and 10. So we chose one, two, three, four hyperparameters now that will set off separate parallel training jobs, um, which will be examined. And then it will uh, help us determine what the best possible, and th that's the most accurate and most regularized model uh, that uh, can be produced with the information that we have. Then we la launch hyperparameter uh, tuning. It's a single command. And then we have our tuning job. And now we wanna see the results, all right? So we haven't really trained our model here yet, right? We've just explored all of the options for hyperparameter tuning. Um, we have a really nice built-in um, uh, notebook here that helps you analyze the results of any training job. So I'm gonna open this up right now. And uh, this will go in, and for each of the hyperparameters that you chose, uh, you'll get uh, specific metrics, all right? So you get final objective value, et cetera. And, and they're nicely illustrated below. So here we could see, uh, where's the label on this one? Uh, let me scroll down just a little bit more. Here we go. Uh, so here we see max depth. Uh, here we see ETA, min child weight, et cetera. Now my recommendation in using this particular notebook when you're just starting using hyperparameter optimization on AWS, in the beginning, to develop intuition, just do one at a time, okay? Because when you're doing one at a time, you can really get a, a strong intuition of what those actual results are. Now, if you go back to the console and we look at the details of these training jobs, of course, every tuning job that you asked for is preserved, so you can look at it. And up here, the best training job is highlighted. It gets its own tab. I mean, it's part of this set with all the training jobs, but um, you, with the, the best training job is highlighted. Um, here you can see what the values are, how they were actually chosen, what the max depth was, for example, turned out to be three, um, min child weight, 4.61. And this is just, <laughs> a really handy tool uh, for XGBoost. Um, uh, so, so that is it. Um, those are all the topics I wanted to cover today. Um, I wanna leave a few minutes uh, at the bottom of the hour here for uh, Q&A. Um, but yeah, those were all the, those were all the key topics that I, I wanted to um, cover. If I could just uh, do one more recommendation, as you go through these notebooks, you're gonna see a lot of data wrangling and data cleaning. Um, if you're relatively new to this, if you're a developer coming into a machine learning situation, um, even if you're a data scientist with many years, but somewhat new to XGBoost and uh, all of the deep learning algorithms, I could not more highly recommend this particular book, uh, Python for Data Analysis, which uh, covers principally, it's a deep dive on XGBoost. Um, I also have uh, a set of references. Uh, if you email me uh, at the email address uh, below there, um, I can send you a number of other references on uh, all of the SageMaker algorithms um, in depth, um, uh, stuff that you can share with customers uh, or with your colleagues in house. So don't be afraid to ask. That's exactly what we're here for. And that's uh, the purpose of this. Uh, of this uh, call. So um, I, we do have some time for questions and I know that my friend Pratap has been patiently uh, waiting. Um, so let's let's go to that. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, we have a, quite a few interesting questions um, that I want you to take up. Um, I've answered some questions by okay. myself um, in the meantime, which were like quick references. Right. Uh, the first question that I want you to uh, uh, take up is, how does XGBoost solve the imbalance class problem in the data set? Do you have any specific parameter uh, to tune? Sure. Um, it's sort of built into the nature of an ensemble model. Um, so uh, first of all, there are many hyperparameters that you can tune that will um, 
uh, help, uh, especially if you have uh, overweighted problems. But the general question, how is it done? Um, it's sort of in the nature of uh, decision tree and ensembling itself. Um, as uh, you begin to build these trees, and um, one thing about gradient boosting that I didn't mention earlier in XGBoost is as you create a model, uh, a surrogate model, and you begin to refine that model with the next iteration, you're actually only focusing on the errors. Um, so as you're focusing on, on the errors and improving on the errors of the previous model, in other words, you're not doing the whole tree from the surrogate tree when you go to the next model, you just focus on, on the errors. Um, there's a refinement um, that occurs in that process. Um, so uh, it, it's, I hope that's helpful, but it, it's right in the mechanism of the algorithm itself. Um, so usually, like in deep learning, you're always going to do some kind of normalization, you know, batch normalization. Uh, but yeah, you don't have to. Uh, you certainly could here, and it's always worth it to take a deep look at your data set um, and, and uh, do proper feature engineering, which is why I brought up that Pandas book at the end. Cool. That, that was, uh, I think that answered the question. Um, the next question is, does XGBoost support local training and hosting? Um, by local, um, I'm not sure if you mean uh, if you can download the SageMaker algorithm to, say, your laptop or local machine, or whether you're saying you can do it on an EC2. Um, the short answer to that question, if that's the question, is no. Um, so, um, yeah, no. Uh, like I said, I usually use the scikit-learn version of um, XGBoost for my model development. That could be 80, even 90% of the time. You know, I'm just sitting there in, in um, scikit-learn. But then when I'm ready to do the large data set training, I almost always, you know, flip the switch, um, use the mechanisms in SageMaker that I just showed you to send off the job to the um, job queue to get trained in the cloud. Um, so yeah, when I'm using Scikit-Learn on my machine, I usually have like a you know small data set, you know at the most you know 20 gig, um, and I just play with it on my machine. <laughs> I like to think of it as playing, and uh, and then you know when I'm ready to do you know much larger data sets, I, I go to the cloud. Okay, I think uh, so. Um, so what he's asking is uh, so there is been a follow up for that question, but we'll get to that um, okay. once I get the full uh, question. Um, the next question I want to go back to the next question, maybe come back to this again. Um, the next question is: Do you recommend doing HPO on every new training job? Um, for example, um, as more data becomes available every quarter, which I want to include as part of my model, or only once for each new problem space? Mm. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, one of the reasons I highlighted uh, those four hyperparameters uh, in particular um, is they have the most influence on uh, the outcome of your model. Um, now, as far as HPO, would I do it on every iteration? No. Um, first of all, uh, you know, it's costly. Uh, you should be careful, uh, especially on large data sets, hyperparameter optimization can take hours. Um, also, in the beginning, if you're not, uh, you know, really super familiar uh, with the way we do hyperparameter optimization, um, it's it's a good idea to like, just tune one, see what the results are. Tune a different one, see what the results are. Um, iterate just a little bit on smaller data sets until you develop an intuition of the capabilities. What's going to happen over time is you're going to have uh, more intuition uh, about your data. Um, matching with uh, relevant hyperparameters. I mean, I did mention we were just talking about this last night. A uh, gentleman um, at the loft yesterday uh, had a financial data set with 4,000 features. Um, and he wanted to take advantage of the ability to overweight uh, one particular feature when running the model. Well, that's one of the things you could do with SageMaker. Um, and he wanted to rerun the model 4,000 times with an individual feature overweighted. I said, okay, you know, have at it. Um, but yeah, so you want to, you know, obviously everybody's solving very different problems. Um, so I'm trying to answer the question generally for everybody. Um, what I'd say though is, you know, to be mindful of cost because hyperparameter optimization is costly. Um, also, uh, we're not the only ones that do this. We have a competency partner named SIGOPT. 
Um, if hyperparameter optimization is really important to you, um, uh, and I'm sure it's important to everybody, I mean, it's who would create any code without optimization? Um, I would invite you to look at our partner SIGOPT as well. Okay, I have the confirmation from the person who asked about the local that uh, it uh, that you have answered the question. Um, all right, so that's all the questions that we have. Oh, okay. All right, well, XGBoost is a rock star algorithm uh, for tabular data. Um, it, it, you know, it's useful not only for creating production models, but also for just exploring your data. So um, thank you for your time here today. And uh, let's see, you've got one more slide here. Uh, there's my email address and Twitter handle. Um, eager to help anyone with any uh, follow on questions from the presentation. I uh, don't know if there's any comments at the end. Sue, do you want to chime in? Uh, if not, then uh, once again, just thank you very much. I appreciate your time and uh, have fun with XG Boost. Hey, Pratap, do we have any more questions that we need to get answered, or are we all good to go? We are good to go. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. We really appreciate it. And in the email that you get after this webinar, you'll get the um, link to register for the next webinar. So look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.